welcome to the seventh class of the International Sports Hall of Fame. Now I'm going to introduce Jim Lorimer, who is going to start the ceremony. Greetings and welcome to the 30th anniversary. Arnold and I have actually been partners for 42 years, but this is a proud 30th, and to let you know a little about what's happening on this weekend, this is the largest we've ever had. We have 21,000 athletes yes. competing in 78 events. Of that 21,000, 11,000 are girls and women, 10,000 boys. But we thank you for being here, and we hope you'll take the time to enjoy what is happening next door, because there are 1,000 booths over there, and right now on the floor there are 10,000 people visiting. All together we bring into the community 200,000 people. So it has grown since our original bodybuilding purpose. But a man who has been with us from the beginning, and the man who founded this great organization seven years ago, is Dr. Bob Goldman. He is chairman of the International Fitness Hall of Fame. He's also World Medical Chairman of the International Medical Commission of the International Federation of Bodybuilders and a 190-nation organization. He holds four medical degrees. He's founder of the National Academy of Sports Medicine. He has personally set over 20 world strength records as is listed in the Guinness Book of Records. He has a seventh degree karate black belt and Chinese, and he's a Chinese weapons expert. He has been a top supporter of Arnold Classic and Arnold and us for 30 years and more. And we thank him, but we're proud to introduce him to you. Thank you. Stay, stay, stay up here for a minute. Stay, come over. Okay. You know, how do you recognize two men who in 30 years are affecting millions of lives. And I was thinking, what could I do to recognize two giants? Well, I came up with something kind of giant to recognize them. For Arnold and Jim, both of you, come oh. up. Wow. These are handmade, coated in gold, with the, with the logo on it. Arnold, feel, make sure it's heavy enough. Hey, Jim, you want to feel one of these? Okay, so we have, and your names are on there also. Good. So they're all custom. It took six months, but they made it here a week ago, and so we're all good to go. Wow. Thank you very much. Okay. Let's get a picture. And, you, and Arnold's going to wear it as a watch, so he always beats me. When we do our watch competition, he's always going to beat me. Thank you, Jim. And again, what, what these two gentlemen have done is off the charts. They are literally have changed millions of lives. And, and it's just an honor to be associated with them in any fashion. Now, the International Sports Hall of Fame was founded not only to recognize these absolutely amazing athletes, but these are also absolutely amazing people. Because in order to be a candidate for the International Sports Hall of Fame, you must also give back. And that's a very, very important theme for us because it's not just creating and becoming a champion or a legend, but what do you do to help the new legends to be come into being? The medals that they'll be receiving today are 18 karat gold. We upgraded the custom made boxes for everybody. And now each of the attendees, these are 2.5 2 pounds weight so they get their neck work out at the same time. In order, to, in order to lift yourself up, you should lift other people's up, and the best way to find yourself is in the service of others. Perseverance 
is failing 19 times and succeeding on the 20th. So persistence overcomes resistance. Now we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. So these individuals have done so much. And there's also someone I'd like to recognize who has been my right hand for the International Sports Hall of Fame. And I'm officially announcing Mr. Fairfax Hackley is now the Vice President of the International Sports Hall of Fame. to turn this upside down for him. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. He gave me the wrong plaque the other day, too. <laughs> Congratulations, bro. Thank you, bro. Okay. Now we're going to start with the first inductee. But before I do that, we've got a bunch of our past inductees here. Kurt, stand up for a second. Previous class. Mark Henry is also on the advisory board. Don the Dragon Wilson, seven-time Mr. Olympia, Miss Olympia, Corey Everson, Cynthia Rothrock, world champion, Franco Colombo, Mr. Olympia, and, and Arnold's bike riding champion, Bill Kazmir, world's strongest man, <clears throat> Ed Cohen, 70 world records. And of course, Anna Marie, Dr. Anna Marie DeMars, Ronda Rousey's mom. Pardon me? Oh, where's Randy? You know, you know Randy, oh, now I see you. I couldn't, see, I couldn't see Randy because he didn't have his hat, you know, he had his hat on, he was hiding from me. Also, we have so many grandmaster martial arts black belts, there's too many to mention. Also, my mom and dad are here for the first time ever at coming to an Arnold Classic. Stand up, you guys. They've never been to an auto classic. They've never been to a bodybuilding show. They've never seen this event. So I thought it was so important that they came in for this. Also, I want to thank our advisory board members, Jim Lorimer, class of 212, Mark Henry, class of 212, Randy Couture, class of 212, um, Jim Mannion, who was here in the head of the MPC, IFBB Pro League, uh, Master Master Alan Goldberg. So these are some of our advisors here. And of course, some of our inductees who are also advisors, Dr. Jan Todd and Dr. Terry Todd, who are in the class of 218, and of course, Governor Arsenal Schwarzenegger in the inaugural class of 212. And thank you all so much for helping out to make this what it is today. <laughs> Our first inductee, Bas Rutten. He's a Dutch mix, mixed martial arts kickboxer, professional wrestler. He was UFC heavyweight champion and inductee into the UFC Hall of Fame. He was a three-time King of Pancras world champion, finished his career on 22 fights Un unbeaten streak of 21 wins and one draw. In four hours, 27 minutes, and eight seconds, he spent as a pro fighter. Boss knocked out 13 people and never got dropped himself. His significant accuracy record of 70.6% is the highest fight metric ever recorded. Attempted a record of 53 submissions and successfully swept opponents 46 times as a pro fighter. His favorite tactics was the liver shot, and if you see the way this guy hits your liver, it explodes. He fought 16 times, winning the first 14 by knockout and 13 in the first round. Boss returned to Pancreas, taking eight more victories, bringing his unbeaten streak to 19 straight fights. He's the first European to be inducted into the USC Hall of Fame, and that was in 215, and he has the Pioneer's Wing in the UFC Hall of Fame. His post-fight career, like most great athletes who are good looking like him, they become television and movie stars. Not only is he coach, he's an inventor, but he's been with Kevin James and King of Queens, he's been martial law, he was in uh, the, uh, you know, uh, comes the boom with uh, Henry Winkler and Kevin James, and one of the nicest guys you're gonna meet, and he's a beast, he's still built like a rock. Boss? Now the real test of their athleticism uh -oh. is we hang this on their neck. So we make sure your neck is still can handle it here. Okay. Oh. <laughs> okay. So we have yeah. less than four minutes. Okay. All right. All right. I was uh, still writing it.
because it was way less than I thought. First of all, first and foremost, thank you, Lord Jesus, for setting me on this path. Very important. And of course, my mom and dad for instilling me, installing me with great principles. You have to work for something if you want it. Hey, you want a stereo for your birthday? That's great. Now get the money for the speakers. That's what they did. Not fun when you're a kid. But you realize when you get older, that was a very good move to make on their part. My beautiful wife, Karen, for 26 years, thank you very much. I mean, this girl, I submitted her in the middle of the night because I would dream of submission. I would wake her up, put her in the submission, write it down, say, it hurts your shoulder, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> write it down next time I would use it in, the, in training. <laughs> Poor wife. Chris Dolman. Chris Dolman is the guy who said to me, I think you will do well in free fighting. That's what they called mixed martial arts at the time. And he put me in uh, contact with the organization Pancras, and that's how I got in Japan, that's how I went to the UFC, bada bing, bada boom, and now I'm here. So this guy's very important. Leon Van Dijk, you're only as good as your sparring partners, they say. Well, I had one for 85% of my fights. Leon Van Dijk, thank you so much. Of course, Fairfax Hackley for inducting me here. Really great, and for, of course, Bob Goldman, this guy. 361 upside down presses. Balancing, that's what he can do. Thank you for recognizing that I'm a really good looking, talented, and amazing guy speeding up that process. By the way, I also have another thing to add to that list, humility. I have great humility as well. <laughs> Schwarzenegger, Arnold Schwarzenegger, what an inspiration he has been for my friends, for me, for everybody in Holland. I mean, all athletes look up high to him, and especially now, me being an athlete from Europe, coming to America, and now suddenly, being in a TV show, by the way, Monday nights, 8 o'clock on CBS, check it out. <laughs> Kevin can wait. You'll be seeing yours truly right here. Thank you. All right, and the most thank you, I would like to thank all the, the bullies that have bullied me when I was a kid. I mean, those are the real reason I'm standing here right now, so thank you guys for that as well. A lot of you probably don't know, but I had a horrible skin disease when I was a kid. I had severe asthma attacks, like an attack from a week in bed, not able to eat because I couldn't breathe. And that went hand in hand with the eczema, which was very bad on my hands and in my face and everywhere. And people always ask me, how did you deal with that? I said, well, it's very easy. I always knew that there was somebody who had it worse than I had. That asthma attack for a week, well, there's people out there who have 365 days a year, every year. That actually, on my hands, they have it everywhere on their faces. So you see, as long as you know that there's always someone out there who has it worse than you, it's not that bad. So, um, how did I deal with the bully? That was very easy. I saw a Bruce Lee movie, Enter the Dragon, <laughs> when I was 12, and I realized, wait a minute, if I'm like that guy, I think the bullying will stop. So I started training, four months later, knocked out the biggest bully in town, and it worked. No more bullying. Yeah, some guys who didn't know about that story, they would come, those poor bastards. <laughs> <laughs> Boom, yeah, that was it. All right, but everybody has bullies in their lives, right? We all know the bullies that we recognize. We have the alcohol bully, the drugs bully, we have the eat bully, the eating bully, the no eating bully, You're sticking the finger in and throwing everything out. But there's some more as well. For instance, what about the pride bully? You know, get rid of that bully as well. No, me, 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 me. I did this. No, you did not. You had a group. Yeah, I know. I understand. I have a partner. I have a training partner. I have some people around me, trainers. But I'm, I'm doing the work. I'm in there. I did this. Get rid of that bully. The ego bully. I'm better than everybody else. Why should I listen to people? Not a good bully to have. A lazy bully. I know. I promised five months to clean up my place and myself. After this weekend, I will do it. That bully. Get him out. The anger bully. I know deep down inside, I know you didn't drive through that red light on purpose, but you scared the heck out of me. And that's why I need to be extremely aggressive towards you right now for like 10 minutes, okay? Get rid of that bully as well. The last thing that I want to say, and I love this saying, it takes a strong person to stand up for himself, but a stronger person stands up for others. And that's what I want people to do. If you see a person who is... Uh, less than us, who less have physical attributes, less fortunate, who you know was just weaker, help that person. Because in order to get into the afterlife, I hear that charity is the best way to do it. Thank you so much, everybody. Godspeed. Thank you. Thank you, boss.
And really, this is what it's all about, giving back, teaching others, mentoring others. That's what puts these people on this stage. Next, we have two people who really of a historical importance. Dr. Terry Todd, Dr. Jan Todd. These are people who have dedicated their life to powerlifting, Olympic lifting, training others, teaching others. They're the co-founders of the Stark Center for Physical Culture and Sports, the largest museum of its kind in the world, with over 150,000 books, photos. In fact, I've donated my papers there. Arnold's donated his papers there, Jack LaLanne, Ben and Joe Weider. So it's the largest historical collection of all of these things that are so important to us as bodybuilding and fitness people. It is also the official home of the International Sports Hall of Fame, and that's where we enshrine the signed posters and medals and so on. Jan and Terry, also the directors and creators, along with Arnold and Jim, of the Arnold Strongman Classic Competition. This is the greatest most prominent strongman competition in the world and brings, as you can see, those six, nine, 425 pound men. Dr. Terry Todd has a career, at a, he had a career as a journalist with Sports Illustrated, ESPN. In fact, back 30 years ago, Terry and I were doing a, a Good Morning American, a few shows like that. The Todds live on a 300 acre cattle ranch in San Marcos River with a large collection of animals, which reminds them of their athletes including five, five peacocks, draft horse, 50 cattle, two Sicilian donkeys, English master dog, emu. At the 1965 Nationals, Terry Todd became the first man to squat 700 pounds at a body weight of 335, and now he's only about 410, I think, so he's come up a little. Dr. Todd became the first man to total 1,600, 1,700, 1,800, 1,900 pounds. Best official list was 720-pound squat, 515-pound bench press, 742-pound deadlift. Um, just a remarkable athlete. Now, the other half, Jan, Dr. Jan Todd. Dr. Jan Todd began her powerlifting career and was considered the strongest woman in the world. As a powerlifter, Dr. Jan Todd set more than 60 national world records, also included in the Guinness Book of World Records for her um, remarkable accomplishments. Jan was the first woman inducted into the International Powerlifting Hall of Fame, and she was also inducted in the first class in the Women's Powerlifting Hall of Fame, and they are the first married couple to be inducted into the International Sports Hall of Fame. You got it, got it? Okay. You get to put this on yeah, I'm going to put it on both of you. All right, there you we go. got two. No, we got two. two. What do you think? We're, we're cheap here. <laughs> I would never actually think that, Bob. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, let me put these on you. Thank you. Fairfax is going to take that for me. Thanks. Here we go. Very nice. Now, I know these guys can handle this, so. Okay. Bob uh, and Arnold and uh, Jim and all the rest of you. Um, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's uh, different than what I expected it would be. And uh, I expected it would be a little bit unusual. And it's nice to see uh, so many people that are sort of have been my, my models, people that I admired, and uh, so many of them here today. Everyone seems bound together by the fact that we all share the idea, at least, some of us more completely, but to some extent, even if we're, we're not primarily weightlifters or bodybuilders or powerlifters, but we all understand the importance in today's culture of heavy training, strength training. And uh, I mean, there are just so many people, and you look, I mean, there's Mark uh, in the front row, it was mentioned about the uh, very first contest. Mark asked if he could be in it, and uh, I was reluctant at first because I thought, well, he's now being advertised by Vince McMahon as the, as the strongest man in the world. I said, what if you go to this show and you win third place? Is Vince going to advertise you as Mark Henry, third strongest man in the world? That's not going to that's not going to be it. Well, it will not work. I said, unless Vince gives you a direct okay, I'm not going to let you in the show. But he went to Vince, and Vince said yes, and uh, Mark managed to win. And, and I will say, and to his credit, every year since then, he has come here on his own nickel, or maybe Vince McMahon's nickel, and, 
<laughs> he's come here and, and to actually pay res his respects to the people who put this show on and make it happen. And he's been a mentor to a lot of the young, strong men who've come up and done well. So that's a fine thing. But so many other people that are just among, you know, the greatest in the field that, that you know, I kind of made my, my, my early focus to be. And I see Franco is here. And uh, of course, Bill and Eddie and uh, just a bunch of other people in here that, there's Kurt. Uh, th these, are, these, are, these are special people. And, uh, but they do share that one thing, the whole business of training. Uh, I look over and I see Jim Lorimer sitting there and, uh, and there are not many people in the room old as, as Jim is and, or as I am. We remember things that most of you wouldn't remember, but we, you, once you went through it, you'll never forget. Uh, and that is the fact that there was a time when if you lifted weights to make yourself stronger or to be physically bigger or to be a better athlete, you, you were looked down on as an idiot, as someone who is too stupid to understand that lifting heavy weights would make you muscle bound. That was the term. You were bound by your muscles. You would be slower and less flexible. And Jim remembers that. You know, I remember that. Uh, I was a varsity athlete at the University of Texas, and the tr trainer wouldn't even talk to me because he said, I know you, you li you're the one who lifts the weights. If you don't stop lifting weights, your back is always going to hurt. And so you stop lifting weights, come back, and I'll help you. So. But that was believed, you know, all the way up through the, the 50s and in parts of the 60s. And it died a hard death. A lot of people went through it. Even Arnold, I would imagine, remembers a bit of that going on even in Europe. Although Europe was always ahead of us in that, in that regard. So uh, I think since we have a kind of limited amount of time on stage, we have to rush back over and uh, do our little bit, a bit with, the, uh, with the cave trolls who are <laughs> over there fighting against one another. But uh, I would just like to say, since I have this moment and with the world's media here, I would like to say to all of the doctors who said it was the worst thing you could do, uh, all of the coaches who said it was the worst thing you could do, all of the sports scientists who said it was the worst thing you could do, you were full of shit. <laughs> <laughs> All, all of you know this. We were right back then. You have been right, even if you just touched an edge of it. But uh, that makes me feel good to say that, and I'm, <laughs> I'm going to step back. Well, that's going to be hard to follow, I think. Um, so I wanted to, I'll be a little different than Terry, but I am a little different than Terry. Um, I think that for me, one of the things I was thinking about this morning as I was getting ready, and our, the strongman contest actually starts on the stage at 145, so if we disappear quickly, it's not that we don't love and appreciate being here and would love to visit with all of you, but we have a, a big contest with a lot of incredible things going on that we have to get back to. But I was thinking this morning as I was standing on this, sort of sitting thinking about what am I going to say, that if I had thought back um, if I had ever thought when I was in high school, and I graduated from high school in 1970, that I would one day be standing on the stage being inducted into the International Sports Hall of Fame, I would have probably also said what Terry just said in terms of the doctors. Because in 1970 when I graduated from high school, I didn't think about being an athlete. I grew up before Title IX. I didn't have the opportunity to play organized sports in my high school because we had no real organized women's teams in my high school. I actually didn't begin thinking of myself as an athlete until after I met this rather handsome, debonair, really, really smart guy with these huge muscles who looked unlike anybody else I'd ever seen, and I married him in 1973. And that changed my life. It fundamentally changed who I was. I went from being a sort of basically intellectual person who saw herself going on to college, which I did, and then possibly on to other places after that, 
but it, I had never ever embraced the idea that I could be strong. So when I decided, because of Terry's example, that it was interesting to think about what women could do who lifted weights. And I'm very proud of what I did back in those early years in powerlifting because I was, you know, I was sort of a pioneer. We broke some barriers, but I also was involved in the politics of the sport and tried to help fight for the right for women to actually participate in powerlifting. But there were other people then who continued to sort of inspire the transition that we've now seen that comes, to, comes here. And in fact, I love the fact, Jim, that you mentioned that there are more women athletes at this event this weekend than there are men. That is a watershed for women in sport, and it's something that we should all make note of. But I think about the fact that the hardest thing for women was negotiating womanhood and strength. Because strength has always been that one physical attribute that no matter what we want to talk about, that we think it's so gender specific. But nobody's saying anymore that girls can't be fast. But we still have trouble sometimes, even now, thinking about girls being strong. And I know that, and I know that Corey Everson knows that sitting in the front row here because she was one of the people, along with Betty Weeder, who started Shape Magazine, who began to, who's also in the, in the Hall of Fame, by the way, who were women who sort of showed us that you could be beautiful and attractive and you could be strong and you could have a life in the world of strength. And so those are really early pioneers and I'm really honored today to be here looking at Corey and looking at Franco, who's Betty's very good friend, and please tell her what I said, Franco, because without them, that would have been much harder to negotiate. And it also makes me very proud to think that we are now living at a time when a young woman like Ronda Rousey can grow up in a world and never have to worry about, is it okay for me to lift weights? So if I helped in any way to do that, I'm very, very proud. Thanks to all of you. I'm very proud also, I wanna just say two other things. Bob didn't mention it, but Mark Henry and Bill Kazmaier were also coached by Terry. And it makes me really happy to see both of you today. So thank you all. The next is, a, is really a new category of sport documentarian. But this individual has done so many amazing things, we added this category to the International Sports Hall of Fame. Phil Kogan is from New Zealand. He's a television personality best known for the amazing race on CBS, which a lot of you have seen, it debuted in 2001. Also the host of No Opportunity Wasted. And this man travels around the world doing really remarkable things and not getting killed. <laughs> the Amazing Race, also the Outstanding Reality Competition program. He's won numerous Emmys for his great work on TV, and he and his wife, Louise, uh, were the creators of No Opportunity Wasted. Uh, he's been the host of The Amazing Race for many years, as I mentioned, and he's hosted over 1,000 different programs and episodes of television, again, putting his life at significant risk over and over again. In fact, he had a list of all the things he wanted to do before he died, but not try and die while he was doing them. <laughs> Climbing Mount Everest, swimming with sharks, bungee jumping, jumping into volcanoes, uh, having lunch down underneath the water with, uh, with man-eating sh sharks, you know, the things we all like to do. So a remarkable individual, but also very charitable. He did the race, and this event raised over half a million dollars, and it was documented in the movie called Ride. So uh, if we can get Phil Kogan up here. Thank you. I'll take this off. Yeah. All right. Looking good. Okay. Wow. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, as I stand here, I'm kind of wondering how a skinny white guy from Christchurch, New Zealand, ends up standing here. For those of you who don't know, that's Arnold Schwarzenegger right over there. Uh, just wanted to point it out. Um, man, uh, I, uh, I am not a world-class athlete. Uh, I, I love athletics, but uh, certainly very humbling to be standing here uh, surrounded by the best of the best, and so thank you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bob Goldman, for uh, bringing me into this uh, incredible family. 
Wow, like I said, it's pretty amazing to stare around here. Fairfax Hackley, thank you for uh, including me. Um, when Fairfax called me, I, I really, I said, are you sure about this? I mean, I, I looked at, he was telling me who was on the list and I said, are you sure about this? And he said, Phil, we're sure about this. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Eric Hillman, for being a, a great friend. Um, and Jim, what an honor to, to, to get to know you uh, and hear your story and hear about the work that you and Arnold have done. And Arnold, of course, for all the work you've done. Last night, for those of you who don't know, we had an event uh, which, uh, which was set up by Arnold to give back to kids, to help kids in after school. Uh, after school. And I just love being around people who have this sense of wanting to give back. And so this documentary that my wife and I made and my producing partner, Louise, can you stand up, please? Because uh, I've been with uh, Louise since 1989. We've been partners uh, in life and, and uh, also in telling stories since 1989. And uh, we found an incredible story about an athlete that had never been recognized. His name was Harry Watson. He was from my hometown of Christchurch, New Zealand. He was a seven-time New Zealand champion, the first New Zealander to ride in the Tour de France, which, in my opinion, is the toughest sporting event on earth. He was part of the first English-speaking team, and nobody in New Zealand knows this man's name. We read the book, and it really it stirred us into action. We felt like, you know, we really need to do something to honor this athlete, because if we don't do something, his name and his achievements will be forgotten forever. So in our infinite wisdom, we decided that the best way to tell his story would be to retrace the 1928 Tour de France on an original 1928 Tour de France bicycle. I happened to be the athlete in, in that uh, retracing. It took me two years to find a 30-pound, one-speed, single-speed bicycle. Uh, in those days, they rode 150 miles a day average with seven stages over 200 miles a day. They climbed in excess of 20,000 vertical feet. I was 46 years old at the time. It just about killed me one day. It was 23 and a half hours riding. I was hallucinating. Um, but we were determined to retrace this story in an effort to bring this, uh, Harry Watson's story back to life. So I stand here today accepting this uh, as a conduit, if you like, uh, representing a New Zealand athlete that I feel really deserves to be recognized. He's not recognized in New Zealand. He's not recognized in the Sporting Hall of Fame in New Zealand. So I'm hoping that when the people in New Zealand from the Sporting Hall of Fame see this, they maybe consider uh, including Harry Watson, this great rider in the New Zealand Sporting Hall of Fame. <clears throat> I, uh, again, I am uh, deeply humbled by this. Uh, congratulations to all the other inductees, and it's amazing to be, again, part of the family. I see all of you here. Look forward to meeting you, and, uh, it, well, hopefully after I can have a chat to some of you. Uh, and thank you so much again. It, it is a true honor. We, uh, we decided we're 90 years late, but this is for Harry. Oh, this is for Harry. Wow, thank you. <laughs> Our final inductee, and I know everyone is just thrilled about having Rhonda Rouse here. Let's hear, give it up for Rhonda. One of the hardest working athletes we've ever seen, and also the youngest inductee into the International Sports Hall of Fame by a lot of years. And she and her mother, Dr. DeMars, are the first mother-daughter group to ever be inducted into the International Sports Hall of Fame. So let's give it up for both of them being mother-daughter team. As we all know, Rhonda is a world champion mixed martial artist. She's also a movie star. She was the first American woman to earn the Olympic medal in judo, gold medal at the 2007 Pan American Games. She was a former UFC bantamweight champion as well as last Strike Force women's bantamweight champion. She's won 12 consecutive MA fights, six in the Ultimate Fighting Championship of the UFC. She won 11 of those fights in the first round, nine of them by armbar. ESPN poll selected Ronda as the best female athlete ever. Not only decorated as a Judica, but also inducted into so many other 
Hall of Fames, as was her mother into the Judo Hall of Fame in 1984. She trained, she trained with her mother when she was into, until she was 13 years old after accidentally breaking her mother's arm. Her mother's wrist, I'm sorry, just the wrist, not the whole arm. But she, would, uh, she was sort of payback because she'd always get woken up by her mom with an arm bar in the mornings for submission holds. That's the way they would wake up. November 212, the UFC announced that Ronda would join the UFC, the first female fighter ever to join the UFC and sign with them. She won her first fight by knockout in just 16 seconds into the first round, and another one with an armbar in 14 seconds, the shortest match in UFC championship history. In October 2015, Ronda became the first female athlete to guest host ESPN Sports Center. She was on the cover of Ring Magazine, first ever. She became the first mixed martial arts, to, martial arts person, female, to ever appear on the cover of a boxing magazine. And of course, we're well fam familiar with her roles in The Expendables 3, Fast and Furious, Entourage. She just recently signed with the WWE. She's just getting started. This girl has got one career ahead of her. Let's give it up for Ronda Rousey. Hi guys. Um, you know, I uh, I had no idea what I was going to talk about even this morning, and I was thinking about. Hold on, I got to take this off. This is heavy. Um, <laughs> and I was thinking about all the different things that people talk about, like courage and perseverance and all these sort of things. And I was thinking that people so often try to give advice on how to become a success, but no one ever talks about how to be a success. And um, I was thinking about a lot of what my mom, of course, <laughs> is my uh, moral barometer, and um, she always would just simply say, just do the right thing. And it sounds so simple, but um, when you're in the process of trying to become success, your decisions are a lot easier. They're made for you. They're made for you by necessity. I have to do this, I have to do that, I have to do that. And, um, when you become a success, you suddenly have your options available to you and you can make choices that are not made for you because of what you have to do. And um, there's going to be times when you're going to be faced with a decision of, you know, you could do the right thing or you can do what makes you look good. A lot of times doing, what, doing the right thing and what makes you look good is the same thing. But at some point it's going to be different. And at some point, you're going, to, you're going to run into a situation where you can choose between doing the right thing or doing what makes you the most money. And a lot of times, doing the right thing can make you a lot of money, but sometimes it's going to be different. And you have to think about what kind of a success do you want to be? Do you want to have as many people like you as possible and make as much money as possible, or do you always want to do the right thing? And I know I'd probably have a lot more money and be a lot more liked if I didn't always choose to do the right thing. But no matter how many likes you can get on Instagram or how many zeros are in your bank account, they can't buy you a good night's sleep. And so to all of these people here who are already great successes, you don't need advice from me on how to become successful. My advice to you on how to be a success is every single time that you're faced with those difficult decisions, do the right thing. Thank you. Now, you know why all of us come here every year for 30 years? Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, or Arnold, as we all know him, is my own personal hero and the hero of all of us here. And as I've said before, every year, there's only one person born like him every century. Uh, his level of charisma, his leadership, and all that he is able to do is really off the charts. And it's always an honor, and I'm always humbled every time I'm around this man. He is off the charts. Let's give it up for Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger. I am just going to say a few words. I just want to say thank you again, Bob, for having this event here at the Arnold Classic Sports and Fitness Festival. It's always wonderful to see you 
uh, with us. We've been doing this for 30 years now, coming here to our uh, great, great events. And I'm very excited also that Jim Lorimer, my partner, is over here and that he's still in great shape and it looks like we're going to do this for the next 10 years together, minimum. And uh, so that's always great. I mean, without this guy, we would not be here because he is the best promoter and best organizer and he is my best friend and, uh, sorry, Franco, uh, and uh, <laughs> my best friend is a mentor. It's like a father figure to me. I mean, he's the most extraordinary human being that I've ever met. So it's great. Let's give it up uh, for, for Jim Rama. He's seen that over there. And as, as Jim said, that we, uh, in 1970, when I won the Mr. World competition here in Columbus, Ohio, we made a commitment together that we are going to go on a fitness crusade and a bodybuilding crusade and promote bodybuilding and fitness and that's exactly what we have done. Uh, we started in 1976 uh, with the Mr. Olympia competition and Mr. Universe, Mr. World, Mr. Olympia and all those competitions until we started the Arnold Classic, which is now the 30th anniversary of the Arnold Classic. Uh, but as uh, Terry Todd was saying that in those days, uh, people were not too fond of bodybuilding and of weight resistance training. And they said all the things that he said, that you get muscle bound and you get a heart attack and you're going to live less and uh, you most likely become a narcissist training in front of all of those mirrors. And uh, also the possibility is very high you would turn gay. And uh, so those are the kind of things, those were the kind of things that we heard then. And it is really wonderful today when you see that we have here our sports and fitness uh, festival and we have around 200, 250,000 people coming through and we have 78 different sports that have joined us. Uh, we have, as Jim said, 21,000 athletes. I mean, it's really extraordinary. It basically means that our crusade has been very, very successful and uh, that all of those people that had the stereotypical images of bodybuilding now, of course, um, you know, I don't say what Terry said, uh, because I think that success is always the best revenge. You know, so I think that we have been so successful that now literally every uh, military base has uh, weight facilities. Every hotel that I've gone and traveled around the world has a weight room. Uh, every YMCA, every sports team, every university, every high school, every police station, every fire station, Everywhere there are weight rooms where people are lifting weights. Everyone is lifting weights at home and in gymnasiums and in clubs and in hotels or wherever it is. So that has been really the great, great victory. And this has been the biggest industry growth that we have seen. It's an $80 billion industry worldwide. So this is huge, ladies and gentlemen. All of you athletes, great athletes that are up here and that are sitting down here, all have been part of this fitness crusade. It's never one person that can do that. It takes, takes millions of people to do that and to be that successful. So I want to just say thank you to all of your great, great athletes that are sitting here in the front row, that are up here, that have uh, been awarded today. Thank you for being part of this fitness crusade and we are going to continue on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much.